The story of Eileen Caron Wernos, who gained the infamous title of America's first female serial killer, is not a simple one to tell. In fact, her life was the epitome of a horror story from her conception to her execution by lethal injection on October the 9th, 2002, when she was just 46 years old. Her tale has been told and retold in an array of documentaries and films, the most famous of which is 2003's Monster, starring Charlize Theron. There are books, academic studies, podcast songs, and even an opera about Wernos's life and criminal activity. Even an incredibly compelling documentary, Broomfield Made, about the selling of a serial killer, which conveys the mercenary exploitation of Wernos and those she knew, including three officers involved in the case. So one has to ask the question when delving into her tragic story, is the term serial killer too simplistic to describe this convicted murderer? Is Eileen Caron Wernos a victim in her own right who was cruelly failed by a system that could have saved her? This is the story of Eileen Wernos. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thanks for joining me. I've covered this case before, but I did it at the really, really beginning of my YouTube career and I hadn't found my feet, so to speak, and I wasn't doing the deep dives that I do now. And Eileen Wernos is a case that conflicts me. So I decided that I was gonna cover it properly, quite intensely, and hopefully, even if you've seen the story, watch the films and documentaries, you're still gonna to leave today with a little bit of added value, a little bit more knowledge about this particular case. So let's take a look at what created the woman who would become known as Monster. She was born 29th of February, 1956. She was born in Rochester, Michigan. She grew up in the nearby Troy area. And like most serial killers, when you look at her background, there are a lot of implications that suggested that she was gonna have a difficult life. She had a really troubled upbringing. So she was born to Diana Wernos. Diane Wernos was a mum, and she married her father, who was 18-year-old Leo Pittman on June the 3rd, 1954. When Diane married him, she was 14 years old. I kid you not. There's a whole heap of problems with the fact that she was 14 years old. Firstly, in the UK certainly, and I don't know, in most developed countries, you can't consent at 14 years old and you certainly can't get married. I appreciate there are different rules in different places and spaces and child marriage does occur, but it's ridiculous. I'm just gonna put it out there straight away. It's abhorrent, it's ridiculous. It's a blight on humanity that in the modern world, 14 year olds in the past 50 years have been able to get married, let alone in the present day. And yes, we all know it does happen, but it's disgraceful. At 14, you are not developmentally, you are not sexually, you are not emotionally, you are not life wise in any way ready to be married. So, this is deeply problematic from the get go. The first child, Keith born on March the 14th, 1955, when Diane was just 15 years of age. And then the second child, Eileen, she's born less than a year later. And Diane now is just 16 years of age. And at this point, Diane has already filed for divorce from her husband. So when Eileen is born, she's born into a dysfunctional family, essentially. And her father had a lot of problems. He turned out to be a schizophrenic, but also he was a paedophile. So if you can imagine being with the worst case scenario, well, Diane managed to do that because no doubt she was not protected by the adults around her. And we now have a great understanding as to why he was interested in marrying a 14 year old. Now, Wernos never actually met him, but from the get go, that's gonna cause her a level of attachment issue. She clearly came from a very damaged background. 
Her dad was actually an alcoholic as well. He was a paedophile, as I've said, and he was also a sex offender. So he ended up getting sentenced to life imprisonment. And the reason that he did was because he raped a seven year old girl. He was also diagnosed with schizophrenia and then he took his own life in prison. He hung himself on January the 30th, 1969. And I'd like to say that Diane, as a mother, fared better. And I suppose she did in the fact that she wasn't actually a rapist, but she was a deeply toxic person. She was an alcoholic. And again, I'm going to acknowledge that for a 14 year old to be married off, and to be pregnant at the age of 15 and have two children by the age of 16, it doesn't surprise me that she was probably looking at avenues to deal with her emotional pain and dysfunction and that alcohol may have served that purpose. But the problem is that causes a whole heap of issues for Eileen and her brother regarding her parenting. And Diane just totally abandons both her children in January 1960. Eileen is just three years of age at that point. We also have to acknowledge that by three years of age, you have dealt with a huge amount of slings and arrows of outrageous fortune if you have a parent who is toxic and potentially abusive towards you and is dealing with a dependency issue. So her attachment is going to be massively insecure. She's probably dealt with a lot of trauma. And yes, her mother is no longer looking after her at three. But believe me, there is a lot of damage done at that point. So the mother decides that she doesn't want to be present in their life anymore. So she's going to leave them in the very incapable hands of maternal grandparents. This is Laurie and Britt Wernos. By the way, they were also alcoholics. So frying pan fire tends to be the words that come into my mind. Because clearly this is not going to be a good environment for a child. Now in spite of both of these people being known to be alcoholics... They were still allowed to legally adopt the children. That happens on March 18th, 1960. So it's what you'd expect, isn't it? These two kids already dealing with a dysfunctional problematic background, needing some support, needing a foundation of safety, needing to have primary caregivers in their life who could offer them a secure foundation and a future where they can thrive. So the services are like two alcoholics. Who would be better to present the opportunity for these children to totally transform what could have been a difficult life. Let's just leave them there. What could possibly go wrong? And when we're talking about fractures and foundations, boy, that begins that very unstable future that will eventuate in what we're talking about today. And one of the reasons that we have to look at it that way is if you're looking at the pen portrait of possibility and the fractures and the foundations that can amplify particular behaviours and lead the catastrophic consequences than allowing two adults who have massive issues with dependency to adopt children who already have had an incredibly challenging childhood so far is a recipe for disaster. So life with the grandparents is horrible, especially for Eileen. Her grandfather is very emotionally and physically abusive. He used to enjoy humiliating her. And from a really early age, he starts using slurs like whore. He would regularly beat her. But the way that he beat her wasn't just about the physical violence, which is bad enough. What we know about parents or grandparents or primary carers who beat their children is it doesn't change their behaviour. Often it compounds it and makes it more problematic. It's domestic abuse, whichever way you look at it. Just think about it. When people say it's perfectly all right to hit a child, well, if your partner came up and hit you, you would have them charged and rightly so. It's still domestic abuse and it terrifies a child and it doesn't actually help them to recalibrate their behaviour. They don't do that. All the research says their behaviour is likely to become more problematic. And of course, they can't regulate their safety in the environment and that's another emotionally problematic experience. But this guy, this whole heap of wrong, tells her that when he's going to beat her, she needs to strip beforehand. Now, people can look at this whichever way they want, but for me, that's sexual violation. How dare he have her remove her clothes? It's completely unnecessary, even for a domestic abuser. But the fact that he does that, that makes me think of a sexual sadist, somebody who's very much enjoying the violence he's bestowing on this child, but also enjoying the fact that she is completely vulnerable and naked. Her grandmother, she does nothing to help. 
Now, just put yourself in that position. I don't care if you're an alcoholic or dependent. That doesn't make any difference. There are plenty of alcoholic dependents out there who would go absolutely crazy if they saw a partner doing what I've just described to a child, without a shadow of a doubt, because they've got a moral compass. But the grandmother doesn't intervene at all. She sees this sexual sadist, this violent abuser, attacking this child, and she doesn't intervene, she doesn't offer any guidance, she doesn't offer any support, she does nothing. So as far as Eileen is concerned, this is something that potentially she starts to believe that she deserves. So she ignores her husband's abuse, and then, to make matters worse, she decides that, hey, why don't I join in? So she's consistently emotionally abusive towards Eileen, and because there are no boundaries in this household, and because Eileen is not safe, it turns out that she starts to get sexually exploited outside of the family. So she is repeatedly raped by numerous men within the family and also local men outside it, because believe me, these predators, they converse with each other. If there is a vulnerable child, if there is an opening for that child to be attacked, then those individuals will find them. And if no one is protecting that child, all that will happen is these kind of occasions will escalate further and further. And that's exactly what happens to this poor little girl. And this is all by the age of 11. Can you imagine what her life has been like so far? In fact, down the line, Eileen Wernos will say that she hated the human race. It's unsurprising when you consider what I've just described as her childhood, as the time where she's meant to be able to be naive and enjoy the innocence of her childhood, she is dealing with the relentless attacks of these predatory human beings. By the age of 11, this damage has started to understandably manifest itself and her aberrant behaviours escalate. So she's got an explosive temper as a child and this makes it really difficult for her to maintain friendships. So when we think about why she would be so angry, well, she has no power, she has no control, and no one makes her feel safe. And no one respects her. And people cannot be trusted. So she's developed a reactionary mindset and temperament so that if you cross her, there'll be consequences because she's trying to defend her world, her territory, her personal space. And unfortunately, it's very counterproductive because it's not gonna stop the predators doing what they wanna to do to her. They're adults, of course they're gonna carry on, but it's certainly gonna deflect any relationships being built because people are gonna be scared of her. So again, it's a cycle of causation. It's a chain of consequence that means that she is further isolated and alienated. So she'd constantly fight with other kids and they didn't want to be around her. They were scared of her. And now for the adults who aren't abusing her but are looking into that behaviour, such as teachers, she's a problematic child. They're not understanding where that comes from. They're just seeing the actual cause of conflict and she's at the root of it. And that means that she's not necessarily going to be the most popular person with the adults who aren't abusing her, but are potentially trying to educate her. Now, by the age of nine, she's stealing. She's stealing from friends. She's stealing from family. So that's giving her a reputation. And it's also around the same time that she has a really awful accident. She's playing with fire and she ends up leaving her face and her hands really severely burned. In fact, it does seem that Eileen had a fixation with starting fires as a child, so we know that she started at least three fires during her childhood. And you consider the McDonald Triad, which was created by John McDonald, who was a psychiatrist, has its critics with respect this triad, but I think it absolutely is a predictor of future violent behaviour. One of the elements is pyromania, the other one is bedwetting, and the other one after that is animal torture and murder. So Eileen certainly has a fixation with fire. Again, because I had a bit of a fixation with fire. Honestly, they had to hide all the matches away from me when I was a kid. And most of the time they managed, but occasionally they failed. They failed when I was at my Uncle Derek's cottage. He had an open fire. I found the matches. I hid behind the curtains at six or five, around my age, and I set fire to the curtains by mistake, because that's what happens when textiles and matches meet. But it was the power, it was the being able to have this control. And for her, you've got to imagine that on steroids, she has no control at all. So being able to destroy things, but be in control of doing that, I imagine satiates some of the rage that she feels. She actually set her home on fire 
at the tender age of nine. Clearly very atypical behaviour. She also set the girl's bathroom at school on fire at the age of 13. And she also set fire to a field at the age of 14. So this is a pattern of destruction and it's also indicative of future problems down the line, particularly violent behaviour. We see that trajectory. But this definitely stems from the fact that she's been very damaged by her early experiences. And we also have to note that her parents were both alcoholics and were lightly dependent during pregnancy, potentially. So that as well could have been an element that in utero, she wasn't protected either. Now, by the age of 11, she's having sex for money, for drugs, for food. And I can imagine drugs and alcohol in particular would be very helpful because she is going to be in emotional pain and that agony needs to be soothed. And the thing about alcohol and drugs is temporarily it can self-medicate the agony that you're enduring. And the truth is, while she is actively involved in seeking sex for money, she's being horribly violated and exploited. She's far too young to be able to consent to any of those things. This is abuse, pure and simple. And the fact that men are doing this to an 11 year old, they absolutely know that that is wrong. Yeah, they can get away with it because no one's protecting this child, but it is absolutely horrific that this happens to this little girl. So she thinks she's exchanging affection. She thinks that these men, these boys actually care for her, but actually they're just using her for their own sexual gratification. She is a child and she is being absolutely decimated by this abuse. It's so also claimed that she was having sex with a brother, so an incestuous relationship, and he's older than her, not massively, but nonetheless, he's older than her. And I do not doubt for one minute in such a dysfunctional environment that this is not something that would be evident. I think that this is very likely to have happened. And she talks about the fact that it's happened, and I don't doubt that that was a reality for her. And at this point, also her alcoholic grandfather, he's sexually assaulting her, also continuing that horrible beating, sadistically forcing her to strip before beating her and so on and so forth. Now we get to when she's in junior high school. At this point, Eileen's found to have hearing and visual problems. And this, they believe, is why she was struggling to adjust. So it was contributing to her poor adjustment, essentially. And again, if you were living in a nice home with people who actually cared for you, they would have noticed that before junior high. It's not hard if you have a child who's got hearing and visual problems, you notice it. Parents are always the first people on the whole to acknowledge these issues because they can tell there is something going on, you know, because they spend time with the child, they like the child, they talk to the child, they have conversations with the child. And so those issues are surfaced, not for Eileen. It takes ages for that to occur. And when they do an IQ test for her, she was tested at 81. Now, an IQ of 81 is low, and that would almost be impaired functioning, so she'd be on the borderline for that. Now, it's at this point that school officials are really concerned about Eileen, and they feel like she could do with some behavioural counselling and emotional counselling to manage her behaviour, essentially. And when they go and speak to her grandmother about this, to say, look, this is an option, this could really help, her grandmother refuses. Honestly, you know, just like any well-adjusted adult will, we've got a real problem with Eileen. She needs some help. And we've considered what we can do. And we recognise that it'd be really helpful for her to have some counselling because that could lead to her changing her behaviour. How do you feel about that? No. Why? I just don't care. Okay, but even if you don't care about Eileen. It'd be really helpful for her to have some counselling because, you know, at the end of the day, she's got some real behavioural issues. This is going to escalate and it can be really problematic, just generally and basically for society in the future. So would you reconsider? No. I'm just going to go off now to witness her being violently abused whilst having a drink. Honestly, remove child when these things happen because there are so many problems with Eileen's behaviour that clearly this kind of behavioural support is required. But as far as they're concerned, there's a better way to deal with intervention for Eileen, and that is to use a mild tranquilizer. I mean, of course, that seems like the obvious option. There you are with all the possibilities for a behavioural intervention where a child can just discuss how they feel 
discuss their experiences, maybe get the support they required, or we can just give them a tranquilizer and hope that it zones them out and means that they're less challenging to manage, even though the child is exactly the same inside. But hey, who am I to question the grandparents in this case? And of course, we know why her grandmother would not want Eileen talking to a counsellor, because you know what? She may tell her the truth or him the truth, and that would be a problem because the family would then have the child's services on their back and potentially granddad would be facing a custodial sentence. So this is about the protection of herself and her husband over the protection of Eileen, who desperately needs that help at the time. So by the age of 14, this is in 1970, we are at a point where Eileen has gone through all of these situations, life has been horrible for her, and then, pièce de résistance, she gets pregnant. Now she claimed a family friend had brutally raped her, and neighbours claimed that the father was a friend of her grandfather's. This would make perfect sense, because her grandfather is a horrific example of a heinous human being, and it's very likely that he was lending Eileen out to his friends because he didn't care about her, he was sexually interested in her himself, and predators always hang around other predators, that goes without saying. There was also some debate, just so you know, that the pregnancy was actually a result of the incestuous relationship with her older brother, and she does give conflicting reports regarding the nature of their relationship. So she does talk about the fact that she did have an incestuous relationship with her brother. But then there are other times where she disputes it. But people around thought that that was a possibility. The big thing for me is, how come everyone had an opinion on this at the time, but no one stopped it? Everyone knew exactly what was going on, and yet nobody is intervening. You can bet your bottom dollar that if I had a kid in my neighbourhood that I knew was being raped by men and kids in the area, that child would be put to a safe place because I would intervene. But no one's doing that at all, in spite of the knowledge. It's offensive beyond belief. They say it takes a village to raise a child. It does. So too can it take a village to utterly destroy one. Now, unsurprisingly, during that pregnancy, she doesn't tell anyone for six months because she is terrified. She's really concerned about what her grandparents' reaction will be, even though they are responsible for this situation, as far as I'm concerned, because they did not keep her safe. And then the minute they find out about the pregnancy, well, it's kind of confirmed for her that there's going to be an issue because they send her away to a home for unwed mothers, and they were not nice places. They were not a place that you would go to live out your pregnancy with the care and compassion of the workers making you feel safe. You were usually made to feel like a terrible human being, you were usually made to feel a level of incredible shame, and it was not a nice experience for you going through the motions of having your child. She gives birth to a baby boy on March the 23rd, 1971, and cruelly she is forced to give up her baby for adoption. I appreciate she would not have been in the mindset to have a child or keep a child, and for that child, it is likely the best outcome that they were adopted, but that doesn't mean that she would not have had to go through the horrible trauma of an unwanted adoption taking place. She's given absolutely no support, and as far as I'm concerned, it makes perfect sense that she kept that pregnancy a secret. She knew the outcome before it actually happened. So if you think about what I've described so far, Eileen's early life foreshadowed her later life. She was failed by every single adult that she found herself in the care of. And she's already regularly drinking alcohol at the age of 11. And unsurprisingly, she drops out of school a few months after her son was born. I'm surprised she was in school until that point, genuinely. That says something about Eileen Werner's probably that she craved the security and foundation that the education system could offer her when she had such dysfunction everywhere else. But she ends up dropping out. And at this point, she starts to run away a lot. By the age of 15, she's doing that regularly. And I'd say that this is what starts the pattern of running away. So she's hitchhiking, she's drinking, she's using drugs, running away for a period of time, then returning home for short periods of time. And... When she's away from home, she kind of makes her money through panhandling, hustling, pool, and also sex work. So her grandfather, because he's already a horrible human being who doesn't have any care or concern about her, he actually throws her out of home fully when she's 15 years of age. Initially, she's living in the woods near her home. She's supporting herself through sex work. And she has no other choice. Simple as that. She has no other choice. If she wants to eat, 
If she wants to find shelter at times, if she wants to survive, then she's going to have to use her body. It's the only option that she has. So this was her go-to choice until she ends up getting incarcerated. And it's also her go-to choice at this point because it's all she has ever known. This has been her experience from the get-go. In 1971, this is whilst Eileen's living room, her grandmother dies and she dies because she's been a long-term alcoholic. Eileen goes back for the funeral because in spite of that woman deserving no respect whatsoever from Eileen, Eileen obviously feels that it's a respectful and right thing to do. And again, that gives a level of insight into part of her temperament and character. Now, shortly after she returns back for that funeral, she's found by the police living in the woods and they feel it's best for her to be sent to a girl's training school which just feels like a deeply disturbing way of describing an institution, full stop. But I would imagine the girls' training school is all about trying to help her find, shall we say, better ways of living and coping with her life. But I imagine it felt incredibly punitive, and I don't for one minute imagine that she would have had a very nice time there. She was sent there for several months as well. Now, after she gets released, she briefly returns to her grandfather's home. It doesn't last long, though, because... He's horrible and she's probably in a really unsafe place, but desperate times call for desperate measures. But he throws her out after just a few weeks. At this point, she doesn't have any other choice. She reverts to sex work to support herself. In the following years, while she's still an adolescent, she was reportedly raped on multiple occasions, at least 12 times. Now, some people will say Eileen Wernos was a liar. She knew how to spin a yarn, shall we say. But I have worked with sex workers. I have listened to their stories and I have heard consistently in every case, time and time again, these women and men are horribly violated on the job because punters who use their services sometimes aren't the nicest human beings and don't want to have to pay or are quite sadistic in their actions. So it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge that it could absolutely be true that this young girl is taken advantage of and violated many occasions. And unsurprisingly, the criminal life of Eileen Wernos starts young because to some degree, there aren't a lot of choices for her. So on May the 27th, 1974, bear in mind she's just 18 at this point, she gets arrested in Jefferson County, Colorado. She is arrested for a driving under the influence offense, a DUI. She also gets charged with disorderly conduct and firing a 22 caliber pistol from a moving vehicle. She was also later charged with bail jumping, so she obviously didn't stick to her bail conditions. By the age of 20, Eileen Wernos was living in Florida. She'd managed to hitchhike there, and she's probably looking for new opportunities in life, a new start. And boy, does Eileen Wernos get a new start. Kind of wish where this was where the story ended. I really do. I wish there could have been a happy ending for Eileen Wernos, because somehow... She meets and she marries 69-year-old yacht club president Louis Gratz Fell. That literally happened. She married the yacht club president. And that's quite an acclaimed position, isn't it? It's quite an esteemed position. There's a lot of respect that goes around when you happen to be in a relationship with somebody of that level. The marriage was really quick and... Bear in mind, Eileen Wernos was an attractive young woman. And I guess for this 69-year-old guy who, I don't know, should have known better. Let's just put it out there, Lewis. You should have known better. It's really not appropriate marrying such a child when you were a man of that age. But hey, we see that play out time and time again. It's a quick marriage. They even put the marriage announcement in the local paper's society pages. Now, I don't think that any of you are going to be sitting at home thinking, oh, this will have been a marriage that was very successful. No, I think we'll all be agreeing that we expect it to be disastrous. And it is. Lasts for 60 days, which is pretty quick going when it comes down to getting married and starting a divorce. But most of this is down to her behaviour. It's becoming more erratic. She'd been involved in a lot of confrontations at bars. She briefly went to jail for assault. She apparently attacked her new husband with his own cane. So he ends up getting this restraining order against her and that opportunity for a new start just dissolves. Bear in mind, she's got that many fractures in her foundation that holding down a relationship is going to be problematic at any point. But certainly 
when there is such a disparity in age and he will probably have quite traditional values in spite of the fact that he weirdly marries somebody so young and she cannot manage those kind of situations. She's probably very sensitive as well to the judgments of others. So I imagine if they're being seen together in places, she will really be feeling the cold stares and judgment that others will be giving her because she's not from that world. So she ends up getting arrested, she ends up going to prison, and then she ends up returning to Michigan. At this point, she is arrested again, July 14th, 1976. And the reason for that is she throws a snooker ball as a bartender's head. That's very violent. You know, that could really damage, if not kill you. So at this point, she gets charged with assault and disturbing the peace. Now, it's in the same year that that happens, so it's 1976, her brother Keith dies from esophageal cancer. And he actually leaves her $10,000 from his life insurance. Now, this is pretty challenging because if you've never had money and you suddenly get a big amount of money as far as you're concerned, unless you are, shall we say, a temperament-based individual who is sensitive and sensible just by nature, it does happen, you are going to struggle otherwise. And Eileen Wernos is not sensitive and she's not somebody who's stable or sensible. She is, shall we say, relatively wild because of what's happened. So suddenly she has $10,000, which would have felt like a lottery win for her at that moment in time. And she's dealing with the conflict, no doubt, of her brother dying because their relationship was very conflictual and very confusing. So she's managing those feelings whilst getting $10,000 in her bank account. So she's unused to having this money and she literally spends it in two months, just gets frittered away on luxuries, buys a car. I mean, that is the least sensible thing that you can ever do. As my father said, if you buy a car, always buy one second hand because essentially the minute that you give your money over, it's depreciated considerably as you drive it away. So you've literally just thrown your money away. And I am still on that trajectory of belief. I have never bought a new car in my life and I never will do. Thanks, Dad. Eileen didn't get that memo. So she buys this car, writes it off pretty much immediately afterwards. And during the same period that I'm talking about, her grandfather takes his own life. So now we've got even more compounded trauma, conflict, emotional dysfunction going on. And so by the age of 22, she herself is at the end of her tether. And this is in 1978. And she actually attempts to take her own life and she shoots herself in the stomach. So Eileen Wernos is very serious about trying to end her life. She gets hospitalized for two weeks. But then when they do release her, without any mental health support whatsoever, she gets discharged and after a week she overdoses on the tranquilizers. And in spite of that happening, she's given no mental health care at that point either. And this is astonishing to me because if somebody is so serious that they have shot themselves in the stomach and on top of that, they've then been released and tried to take their life again, we have to intervene. This person is in emotional pain and is a danger to themselves. But no, why bother with this young person who's had a horrific life, who is going to end up doing horrific things? Why bother helping them? I mean, what's the point? I don't know, because potentially it will stop a serial killer. Anyway, between the ages of 14 and 22, when you go through Eileen Wernus's life, it turns out she attempted to take her own life six times. Six times. So, she is desperate for help. She's crying out for it. And although men are more successful at killing themselves, therefore there is a higher statistic of males taking their own lives, the truth is that women, they try to take their lives more frequently. So even though they don't succeed, there is a higher level of suicide attempts on the female side than the male side. It's just that men are better at going through with it fully. So intervention at this point could potentially have changed her fate. And when we're talking about serial killers, that's so important because we're talking about human predators and we're talking about the unnecessary loss of victims' lives. We get to May the 20th, this is 1981. At this point, she ends up getting arrested in Edgewater, Florida. And this will demonstrate the kind of mental dysfunction that she's in 
because she does this armed robbery of a convenience store. What she steals, I'm just going to throw it out there. Not that I've ever contemplated doing an armed robbery, but if I was going to do an armed robbery, first of all, I may plan it because I want to know what there is that I want. Secondly, I may scope the area out because I'm going to need to know what I'm going to take and how long I've got to take it. And most importantly, I'm going to kind of have a figure in my head. You know, I'm going to kind of think to myself, what's my freedom worth? Is it worth $1,000? Is it worth $5,000? I'm going to get to a level where I think doing the armed robbery and chancing my freedom and having that freedom taken away, I need to balance whether it's worth it. Eileen Wernos does that armed robbery for $35 and two packets of cigarettes. Two packets of cigarettes. Like, you cannot say whether there was more cash available because sometimes people have changed the tills and therefore there's only an amount of cash present. But there'd be more than two packets of cigarettes. So she could have taken, you know, all the cigarettes, but no. $35, two packets of cigarettes. No consequential thinking whatsoever. She gets arrested for it. She serves 13 months in prison for that. And this, it seems, is where we see a real escalation in her criminal activity. So it starts to really ramp up after this. So on May the 1st, 1984, she gets arrested for trying to use forged checks at a bank in Key West. Then on the 30th of November 1985, she gets named as a suspect in the theft of a revolver and ammunition in Pasco County. On the 4th of January 1986, she gets arrested for car theft, for resisting arrest and for obstruction of justice because she claims to be her aunt when asked for ID by the police. Just going to throw it out there, Eileen. If your aunt is a little bit older than you, it's probably not a good idea because, you know, you haven't got the same head and face. So again, we're seeing now a consistent pattern in arrests, breaking the law and breaching boundaries. And when the police search the car, they find a 38 caliber revolver and also a box of ammunition in her stolen car. So she's in real trouble here. On the 22nd of June, 1986, she gets arrested in Volusia County. And this is because a guy says that she threatened him with a gun and also demanded $200 of him. And police again, they discover a 22 pistol under her passenger seat. So she's driving around armed and now apparently threatening people. Now it's in that same year that she meets and moves in with 24 year old motel maid, Taria Moore. Now I would say this is the first and the only meaningful relationship that Eileen Wernos ever has. It was the second relationship that she'd had with a woman, but I would say this was her one great love. And she later asserted it was love beyond imaginable. Earthly words cannot describe how I felt about Tyria. And that makes me sad because those feelings were definitely not reflected by Tyria at all. In fact, what's really upsetting is that Eileen Wernos tragically was still claiming to be in love with Tyria on the day of her execution. And Tyria for me is love's executioner full stop because I believe that she was far more involved in the crimes and killings and yet she managed to walk away and she managed to remain free and she managed to make money off the back of the incarceration and killing of Eileen Wernos. And also she as a partner is willing to have Wernos supporting both of them with her earnings as a sex worker. So Tyree has happened to sit back and kick back whilst Eileen Wernos goes out and puts herself at risk regularly. Now they're both detained for questioning about an incident involving assault and battery with a beer bottle. That's the following year. And so they're both involved in some quite high level conflicts and they're both quite antagonistic. So Tyra is certainly not some innocent, quiet individual. On March the 12th, 1988, there's another incident, and this is where she, Eileen Wernos, actually accuses a bus driver of assaulting her, and she cites that Moore is the witness of this, which is kind of convenient, no. Hello, there's been an assault on me. Okay, can you tell us about that assault? I can. I've been assaulted by a bus driver. Any witnesses to that? Yes, there is a witness. Who is that witness? Well, it just so happens that it's my partner, my girlfriend. 
I'm not sure that that's going to be an appropriate witness. I think you'll find it is. She's an incredibly honest person and she will validate. I did nothing wrong. And the bus driver did everything wrong. So anyway, they're now supporting each other in these situations. But clearly we can all agree and anticipate that the story that Wernos told was not the correct story regarding what actually occurred with that bus driver. And the police, when they start to investigate Wernos, because they become aware that she is deeply besotted and absolutely in love with Moore, that this is the way to utilise a confession from her. Like I said, as far as I'm concerned, there is no way that Moore is completely innocent of these murders. But I think that, as ever, the police wanted to get a confession. The police wanted to pin the crimes fully on Wernos because it was a nice way of closing the door on what happened and Moore was going to prove a very helpful witness to these and give evidence at the trial so they decide to let her off and just concentrate fully on bringing Wernos to justice. Now let's talk about the murders and for the most part all I ever have is compassion, understanding and sadness for victims but it is a little bit more difficult for me to talk about these victims in the way I'd normally talk about innocent people because if Wernus's story is to be believed, she claimed that every single one of them was carried out in an act of self-defense. So all of the victims were killed because she had to control what was playing out and that she herself was at risk. So I can't say what she said was true, but I also need to at least acknowledge that that was her story. And later down the line, psychologist Melissa Farley, she was actually involved in the case, she would state, Eileen was terrorised by violent Johns and eventually she lashed out in a crazed defence, just like men do when they're also afraid of getting killed or tortured. So she's saying that Eileen, who's known as a visionary serial killer, so I predict a risk and I act upon that risk, that she was acting out in that moment through fear of consequences of not doing. But no matter what, she killed seven men within a period of 12 months. And all the men were motorists. They were all between the ages of 40 and 65. They were all white. And every single one of them had been robbed and shot. And when I look at the victim profile, I can't help but think, did they represent her grandfather or the men that her grandfather allowed to sexually violate her? Are they a representation of the rage that she felt and the powerlessness and the helplessness that she experienced as a child? And in those moments, because they also think that she killed at times during psychotic breaks, was she just allowing herself in that moment to take out all of those hostile feelings that she had built up? on these individuals. It may be that they hadn't done anything to her, but the feeling that they provoked and evoked in that moment was enough to trip her into that action of killing them. Now, the first murder is probably the most conflicting one. That was Richard Charles Mallory. He was 51 year old electronic store owner in Clearwater. Now she claims that he beat her, he raped her, he sodomized her. This is after driving her to a remote area and hiring her as a sex worker he has previously been convicted for an attempted rape allegedly she said that he smeared rubbing alcohol into her rectum a vagina into her nose which should have been unbelievably painful it would have burned horribly they're very sensitive areas and then she said he then violently raped her and he said that he was going to put that alcohol in her eyes as the grand finale now, his body gets found December the 13th. He'd been shot several times in the chest. And that's over kill, isn't it? When somebody shoots and basically unloads the gun into the body of the person that they're killing. So there's no doubt whatsoever she wanted that man dead. Also, items belonging to him, they get found in a local pawn shop. So the receipt itself had Eileen Wernos's thumbprint on it. But a disorganised offender isn't thinking consequentially and she is a disorganized offender it's as simple as that and other stolen items they were traced back to Wernos including a camera including a key so she's not thinking about getting away with these things she's just acting with immediacy 
Now, many they believe his rape of her and her murder of him was actually the catalyst that then sets her on this really large murderous spree. So just five months later, David Andrew Spears, who's a construction worker in Winter Garden, he's 47 years old, he gets declared missing on May the 19th, 1990. And his naked body, well, that's found on June the 1st, 1990, in Citrus County. He'd been shot six times in the torso by a 22 pistol. So again, very similar to the prior crime I've just described. Then just under two weeks later, Charles Edmund Karskadon, he was only 40 years old. He's a part-time rodeo worker. He gets murdered on May the 31st, 1990. He's shot nine times in the chest and stomach, again with a 22 caliber weapon. And Wernos actually wraps his body in an electric blanket, which means that when they find his body, it's badly decomposed. And witnesses actually saw Wernos in his car. She'd also pawned one of his guns. So what are we hearing again? She's clearly not forensically sophisticated and she's not consequentially thinking at all. Then we get to the next killing, Peter Abraham Sims. He's a 65 year old merchant seaman. He'd left Florida for New Jersey and his body's found on July the 4th, 1919, Orange Springs, Florida. Now both Moore and Wernos were seen leaving the car. So bear that in mind, Moore was with her. Wernus's handprint is actually found on the door handle, so that links her to the crime, but his body was never found. And that's a problem because for the most part, you need to find evidence that a murder has occurred for that person to be tried for the murder. The next victim is Troy Eugene Barres, 50 year old sausage salesman from Ocala, that's in Florida. He's reported missing on the 31st of July, 1990. His body's found on August the 4th, 1990. It's in a wooded area along State Road 19 in Marion County. He'd been shot twice. Next, they find the body of Charles Richard. He's known as Dick Humphreys, 56 year old US Air Force Major, former chief of police and child abuse investigator, would you believe? Now, he's found fully clothed. His body was found on September the 11th, 1990. It's in Marion County, where it's discovered. Eileen Wernus alleged that he said, how would you like to suck my dick? And I won't do anything, but you're not getting any money for it. If you suck my dick, you can go scot-free. Apparently, that was enough to make her shoot him seven times in the head and torso. The car's later found in Suwannee County. So, again overkill shooting somebody seven times in the head and torso you've killed them way before you've dislodged that final bullet and then we have the final victim walter gino antonio he's a 62 year old trucker and a security guard as well as a reserve police officer and his body got found on november the 19th 1990 in dixie county he'd been shot four times in the back and the head his car got found five days later in brevard county so big escalation in killings. Also, a lot of overkill in the way that she shoots them. Also, some indications and implications that some of those individual victims may have been acting inappropriately around her. And that being said, is still absolutely no excuse for shooting and killing these men. I can understand the first one, Mallory. I really can, with respect. Just throwing it out there. I think he was a whole heap of sadistic and I think she probably did kill him because she thought her life was at risk, but we can't say the same for the others. On July the 4th, 1990, she actually finds herself in a situation where she's abandoned Peter's CM's car. This is because they've had a road traffic accident. So she's with Moore. And at this point, there's a witness, Rhonda Bailey. So she provides a description of the two women. Bear in mind, like I said, the two women not the one woman. So Tyra Moore was there. In fact, Tyra Moore was the person driving. At this point, the media launch a campaign. They want to find them. So the police are looking for two women. Belongings of CMs are found in a pawn shop. Of course, they find Wernos's fingerprint on a receipt. She's got this police record. She's on the police database. So now they know who she is. At this point, therefore, they can arrest her. And that happens on January the 9th, 1991. She's actually at a biker bar in Volusia County. 
and they arrest her at that point on the pretext of an outstanding warrant in the name of Laurie Grody. They also find more. She's located in Pennsylvania the next day and she at that point agrees to basically sing like a canary. So she says that she's going to help the police however they want and the way she's going to do this is to get a confession from Wernos in exchange for immunity from prosecution. I.e. she will face no charges. Eileen Wernos will take the absolute hit for every single thing even if Tyra Moore was absolutely complicit and colluded with the crimes. And for Eileen Wernos, who bear in mind has been supporting them both through sex work, putting herself in positions of danger, whilst Tyra has been happy to take the cash, that is going to have been an enormous betrayal. Because Eileen Wernos certainly was in love with Tyra Moore. But this is what she's decided to do. She's decided to save her own skin by hanging Eileen Wernos. It's as simple as that. So more, she returns to Florida with the police. And they house her in a motel, and she then starts making various calls to Wernos. She asks her to help her clear her name. And I have to say, for me, it does feel, I've used the term love's execution, but it really does feel like I need to repeat that, because I genuinely feel that Wernos was absolutely willing to sacrifice herself to protect more. So, she says to Moore, I'm not going to let you go to jail. And she had to listen to those tapes play in court. And all I felt was that her foundations just fractured further. The hope that she'd been loved by Moore just disintegrated to some degree. Because she loved her, but that was not reflected. So listening to those tapes in court, she's weeping. It must have been absolutely heartbreaking for her. And later down the line, she said, Tyria was using me monetarily. Hello? Hi. Yes. Yes. Hi. Hey. Hey, I had to call you early because I didn't know if you were going to leave today or what. I don't, what the hell is going on, Lee? They've called, they've been up to my parents again. They've got my sister now asking her questions. I don't know what the hell is going on. Huh. Were they asking your sister questions? I don't know. Hmm. If Lee, they're, right. they're coming after me. I know they are. No, they're not. They're They've got to. They, why are they asking so many questions then? Honey, listen, listen, listen. Do what you got to do, okay? I'm going to have to because I'm like going to go to jail for something that you did. This is unfair. My family is a nervous wreck up there. My mom has been calling me all the time. She doesn't know what the hell's going on. Okay. you got to do, okay? All right. What? I'm not going to let you go to jail. You evidently don't love me anymore. You don't trust me or anything. I mean, you're going to let me get in trouble for something that I didn't do. I said I'm not. <laughs> Listen, quit crying. Listen. I can't help it. I'm scared shitless. I know. I love you a lot. I don't know whether I should keep on living or if I should... No, Ty, Ty, listen. <sighs> what if they don't believe me? Ty, listen. What? I'm not going to let you go to jail. Listen, if I have to confess, I will. <laughs> Yes. Why the hell did you do this? Uh-huh. Why did you do this? I don't know. <laughs> Listen, Ty. What? I'll probably never be able to see you. Do you know that? Yes. I love you. If I have to confess everything just to keep you from getting trouble, I will. Okay. So don't worry, okay? Okay. I love you. No. We'll do it now. Get it over with. Right at this very moment? Yeah, get it over with. All right. Okay? Okay. You can right call me back moment. later. All right. All right. Okay, bye. And when you're somebody who's grown up with such terrible attachment disorder or abandonment issues, when you meet somebody that gives you a shred of attention and affection, you often go into that relationship full bore because you've never had a sense of safety. You've never been in a situation where you've been given even a shred 
of compassion. So even the lightest touch of somebody being slightly kind can feel transformative. Like somebody visibly sees you as a human being and makes you feel special, even if it's just a small amount, even if they then abuse you, coerce you to do things you shouldn't do, because they've given you that first experience of tenderness it's compelling and it means that you will accept horrible behavior in the future or you'll do anything to protect them because they're the only person who stood out significantly in a way that no one else had before. So I do at this point feel a level of sadness for Eileen Wernos in the betrayal that Tyria Moore undoubtedly gave her because like I said, it was authentic. Where Wernos was concerned, she really was in love with Tyria Moore. We get to January the 16th, this is 1991, it's just days after Moore's recorded call. At this point, Wernos confesses to all the murders. She claims that the men had tried to rape her and that she killed every single one of them in self defense. And it feels like she was determined to protect Tyria no matter what it cost her. We get to the trial. This is January the 14th, 1992. She goes on trial for the murder of Richard Charles Mallory. Now, although previous convictions are normally inadmissible in criminal trials, under Florida Williams' rule, the prosecution was allowed to introduce evidence related to her other crimes to show a pattern of illegal activity. But that is going to really bias the jury. Let's just be honest about that. If you hear that somebody has been involved in a whole chain of events, you're not seeing the reasons behind that. You're not seeing what's happened to lead her to that moment. You're just hearing it cold. It's going to be brutal in forming a bias where the jury is concerned. So this gets brought in. And on January the 22nd, 1992, Wernos was convicted of Mallory's murder. And this is obviously with the help of Moore's testimony. Now, at her sentencing, psychiatrists for the defence, they said that Wernos was mentally unstable. They diagnosed her with BPD, which is borderline personality disorder, and also antisocial personality disorder. BPD is often linked to trauma. And my God, this woman has had a lot of trauma in her childhood. If you cannot regulate your sense of safety in your childhood, if people abuse you horribly, if you never feel a sense of security, you are going to have a struggle with your emotional vocabulary. Often that results in you struggling to regulate your feelings and you can act in a more extreme manner, but it does not make you a serial killer. She's also diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, which will make her, shall we say, more malevolent than the average person. But these are brought in, and as opposed to the BPD being given a kind of understanding by those passing sentence and recognising that she must have had a pretty traumatic upbringing to develop this kind of issue, they don't give her any leniency whatsoever. So four days later, she is given the death penalty, the judge and jury ignored all the mitigating mental health grounds and I doubt very much they took into consideration her childhood. Wernus's defence did make efforts during the trial to introduce evidence that Mallory was previously convicted for attempted rape in Maryland and served a sentence in a maximum security correctional facility. And think about it, they introduced her stuff. Why didn't they introduce his? But... The very fact that this guy was actually in a place where he had to be rehabilitated because he was a sex offender, they decided that that didn't need to be brought in. So records obtained from the correctional institution showed that from 1958 to 1962, Mallory had been committed for treatment and observation resulting from a criminal charge of assault with intent to rape. These records also reflected eight years of overall treatment from the facility. And in 1961, it was observed that Mr. Mallory had possessed strong sociopathic trends. So he's a horrible person. Sorry, he just is. I appreciate there is a spectrum where sociopathy is concerned. But when you're attempting to rape somebody and you're also considered a sociopath, you're the worst of the worst. Now, in spite of this, the judge refused to allow those records to be admitted into court as evidence and denied Wernus's request for a retrial. It's absolutely appalling. Considering her previous crimes had been used against her, how dare they not let reality to play out 
and bring in his prior conviction that is absolutely within reason to do because it is a pattern of behavior. Just as she shows a pattern of criminality, he shows a pattern of sex offenses. It's at this point that Eileen Wernos makes a grave error and hires, shall we say, potentially the most incompetent private attorney that has ever walked the earth. Genuinely, I would have rather had Ted Bundy representing me than Steve Glazer. It's like Eileen Wernos got the checklist of what you don't need. Because for the most part, if you were looking for an attorney and they were like giving you a list of potentials, you'd be like, well, what I really want for my attorney is somebody who, you know, presents really well. Just let me check. So when you say presents really well, do you mean as in verbally? Oh, well, no, first of all, I want it to all be about, you know, image. So sharp suit, booted nicely, struts, looks confident because I want the jury and the judge to take them seriously. Okay. Ticked. Also, I want them to be able to verbally present because I want them to be able to, you know, know their stuff and act in a way that means that I have the best chance of getting away with what I've been charged with. So somebody who's very verbally competent. Absolutely. And I would also like them to be a non-exploitative type of individual. You know, somebody who is seeing me as a client that they want to protect. So not somebody who'd ever want to sell your story or make money from interviews or exploit you in any way that could cause you an issue with the case. Exactly. It's like you're reading my mind. And finally, I would like them to, you know, not be heavily under the influence of drugs when they're advising me. Well, that would go without saying. I mean, what kind of a lawyer would be heavily under the influence when advising somebody who's on death row? Exactly. Just hang on a minute. We'll have a look. Mm. Oh, we have the absolute opposite of that. Steve Glazer. But on a positive note, he's cheap. I'll take it. Honestly, what I've just said is absolutely true. Steve Glazer is everything that you would not want to represent you when you're dealing with such serious charges. But this is who's employed and he is horrific. So on March 31st, 1992, Werner ends up pleading no contest and guilty to the murders of Charles Richard Humphreys, Troy Eugene Barres and David Andrew Spears. This is on the advice of our incompetent private attorney, Steve Glazer, who I'm not sure didn't want to actually be some kind of rock star. He would never have made that either. He would have been an incompetent rock star. But he is as far away from what you would need as a lawyer as could be dreamt up in your worst nightmares. But she does this because he's advised her to do it and she says she wanted to get it right with God. Now, in the statement to the court, she said, I wanted to confess to you that Richard Mallory did violently rape me, as I've told you, but these others did not. They only began to start to. I have made peace with my Lord and I have asked forgiveness. I am sorry that my acts of self-defense ended up in court like this, but I take full responsibility for my actions. It was them or me. I am sorry for all the pain that my actions have caused. I am prepared to die if you say it is necessary. On May the 15th, 1992, Wernos was given three more death sentences. In June 1992, Wernos pleaded guilty to the murder of Charles Edmund Karskinen. And in November 1992, she received her fifth death sentence. Then in February 1993, Wernos pleaded guilty to the murder of Walter Geno Antonio. And she was sentenced to death again. A lot of death sentences there. Throwing it out there. Not really required to get more than one. I don't believe, but just like she overkilled in the murders, maybe they felt the need to overkill her when it came down to the death sentence. Now, no charge was actually brought against her for the murder of Peter Abraham Siems because his body was never found. But in all, Eileen Wernos received six death sentences. She actually asked the judge, how many times are you going to kill me? And I completely empathise with that statement. Now, after these hearings, you won't be surprised to know that Glazer, the absolute pathetic excuse for the attorney, his incompetence gets highlighted. So the state's capital collateral office said she actually deserved new trials because she essentially had no representation whatsoever. Glazer had no experience. He was an absolute bastard. It's the only way you can describe it. What an absolute 
piece of work. He was negotiating cash deals with media outlets for interviews. He was recorded of having smoked seven joints before going to advisor in prison. That in itself is reprehensible. What a failure. This woman is incredibly vulnerable. She's been failed by every man that she's ever had any interaction with. And now the very lawyer who's there to protect her does not care at all about her. Doesn't care about her life, her freedom, her past, her experiences. He doesn't care about the advocacy. All he cares about is making a cheap book and getting stoned. Prosecutor Phil Van Allen, he basically said that she was in a mission of self-destruction. But this is putting the onus back on Eileen Werners. And Eileen Werners is in a vulnerable state. She's not in an intellectual state where she can make positive decisions for herself. And she's so damaged that everything that she does is a cycle of destruction. So I do agree with prosecutor Phil Van Alley saying that that's what her cycle was like. But that doesn't answer the questions of, firstly, how was she failed so horribly? And secondly, is it therefore appropriate that she's ended up with a death sentence? And the exploitation just continues and continues and continues. So when she's in prison, she gets adopted by Arlene Prowl. So Arlene Prowl is this evangelical Christian. So she claims that she had a dream about Jesus telling her to befriend Arlene. And I can imagine that would happen. I imagine it's exactly the same where the woman who married Richard Ramirez whilst he was in prison for the heinous murders, that she got the same message, marry Richard, he's a perfectly acceptable human being and I want you to make him a better person. Are you sure? Isn't he murdered 14 people in 14 months? He has, but I've taken my time out of this busy schedule to ensure that, you know, you, a woman with a very high Q of a Relieve 158, thinks that it's a good idea to go ahead and be betrothed to this monster. You know, because everybody deserves to be loved. I imagine that that's exactly the same where Arlene Prell was concerned. Yes, you just need to adopt her and everything will be fine. I mean, for a start, adopting an adult's weird. It just is. I'm all for being loving and empathic and kind, but it's weird. Secondly, she's going to get put to death. So it's not like you're going to be decorating a room at home for her and hoping that she's going to be coming out soon. I mean, it pangs of what I would consider as a publicity stunt. Call me a little bit cynical. Call me just a little bit on the cynical side. But I think Arlene Perel absolutely was as religious as the brick that is forming part of my house. So she's the evangelical Christian, of course she is. She's had this dream about Jesus telling her to befriend Eileen, but actually it turns out she was using her to fund her failing farm. Of course, classic evangelical Christian there. Just uses Jesus so that she can get her farm funded. But she receives a cut of the $10,000 that Steve Glazer got for interviews. And it also turns out that Glazer and Prowl had given advice to Eileen on how to take her own life in prison. Who doesn't want a mother like that? I mean, when you're looking for a potential adopted parent, you're thinking, what I'd really like is an individual who can advise me of how to take my life most appropriately. But that just sums up Glazer and Prowl, doesn't it? Probably thinking about the interviews that they can do after Eileen Wernos kills herself. That would be a perfect marketing opportunity, bring in that dollar even further. And it's at this point that Eileen Wernos once again realises that she's been betrayed for money. And she said, she fooled me to bury me. I think her motive was just to make money. Yes, Eileen, her motive was purely to make money. And let's just hope that Jesus ain't going to think too kindly of that woman when she arrives at the pearly gates. I'm imagining that hopefully it will say something like closed to heinous individuals who use people on death row to gain cash for their farm. Something like that. Maybe a bit more catchy, you know? Take the lift down, bitch. That kind of thing. So Wernos at this point starts to tell quite a lot of inconsistent stories about the killings as well. So bear in mind, she initially says that the men had either raped her or attempted to rape her while she's working as a sex worker, but then she starts to recant that. So she recants the claim of self-defense. She says it was robbery and it was a desire to leave no witnesses as the reason for murder. And this is when she does an interview with filmmaker Nick Broomfield. If you haven't seen 
Nick Broomfield's film, Selling of a Serial Killer. I would strongly recommend it. I think Nick Broomfield is one of the most empathic and sensitive, compassionate filmmakers there is. And the documentary is as compelling now to watch as it was. In fact, there's two. But he is absolutely astonishingly good at putting this together. So he's doing these interviews with her. And then when Wernos believes that the cameras are off, she says that it was actually in self-defense, but she can't stand being on death row anymore, where she'd been at 10 years for that point. She wants to die. And bear in mind, we've seen the suicidal behavior in the past. I completely understand that it would push her to a point of wanting to succeed where she'd failed when she was younger. And her mental health just consistently and continuously starts to deteriorate. And it feels like death just became more preferable for a woman whose life had been literally intolerable since conception. She dropped all her appeals. She rejected witnesses that could genuinely have helped her. So childhood friends and neighbors that could have corroborated all of those stories of abuse. And they were willing to. In fact, she stated, you have to kill Eileen Wernos because she'll kill again. The very fact that she's actually disassociated from Eileen Wernos, she's talking about her in the third person as if she isn't that individual. So she's created this character, this caricature of a human being who's now the merciless evil killer, as opposed to the abused, broken, fractured human that's been destroyed again and again and again. And let me tell you, I'm not defending her actions. I'm not. But I'm saying chain of causation. Let's look at what created her. Let's acknowledge that reality. Psychologist Phyllis Chelsea's book, Requiem for a Female Serial Killer, they emphasised the absolute horrors of Wernus's life. She said she'd been beaten and raped so many times, if she were at all human, she'd have to permanently be drunk or out of her mind. And I think that is a really good summing up, that she'd have to be permanently drunk or out of her mind just to survive. Wernus actually wrote to Chester saying, I'm a female who's been raped and the male dominant world is laughing. They've succeeded in putting me in the chair to prove that men can do and will do as they want to us women in America. Julie Blindell, who's an investigative journalist, she asserts that Wernos fits the role of a victim serial killer though. She said news coverage amid any mention of the tormented mental state that she was in she was just depicted as this sexual deviant who seduced and murdered innocent men. So they basically projected Wernos into a caricature of who she really was to fit the stereotype of expectation where a serial killer is concerned. And it's also worth mentioning that female serial killers are judged even more harshly than the male counterparts because it's seen as going against the very nature of what makes a woman. In fact, the judge said, that she was the most evil person that he'd ever come across. And it's like, mate, did you ever hear about Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez? Did you ever hear about a huge list of men who tortured and terrorized their victims before killing them? Can we please get real? What she did was horrific, but he, she ain't no evil murderer in comparison to the people I've just mentioned. She was a visionary killer. She killed potentially in psychotic breaks. She shot them all without torturing them, etc. She is not even in that ballpark of the Bundys and the Kempers in this world. And even Florida State Governor Jeb Bush, they actually used her case to his advantage whilst he was running for re-election. Because they do that, don't they, the state governors, that I'm the most moral person in the whole world and I'm going to use this person to evidence the disparity between them and me i.e. she's a horrible, evil individual who deserves death, and I'm a really good human being who deserves being elected. Now, don't get me wrong, he did grant a stay of execution on September the 30th, 2002. This was to assess whether Wernos was competent to be executed. Caveat, she wasn't. And he stated, I hope to have these competency issues resolved fairly, but promptly. Yeah. It only took 15 minutes for a psychiatric assessment to ironically deem her competent for execution. 15 minutes. Wow. Anybody can get the name of that psychiatrist? Because, you know, in the UK, the NHS is really struggling with assessments because they are complex and they take time. But 
No, not for this psychiatrist. 15 minutes. Wow, we could just whip through them, couldn't we? You get those waiting lists in the UK right down using this kind of individual, particularly if they can make such massive decisions about somebody being competent for execution in such a short amount of time. But there you go. When it comes down to Eileen Wernos, it seems that that's how quickly they could make that life over death decision. Bear in mind, this was in spite of a number of her sacked attorneys literally writing to the Supreme Court to express their concerns that she wasn't actually competent to stand trial. The sacked attorneys of her defending her, they had no reason to, but they knew she was deeply psychologically dysfunctional and dealing with mental health decline that was enormous meaning that she was not competent. Even before she was killed, so the day before her execution, she was exhibiting real signs of paranoia, real signs of instability. She was claiming that the prison guards were poisoning her food, that she had to wash it before consuming it. That is psychosis right there. But hey, 15 minutes with the psychiatrist eradicates all that reality. That isn't happening. She's perfectly competent. Rag single who was the attorney appointed to represent her after she complained about conditions on death row. They argued she's got to rely on someone to stand up for her, even though she doesn't want that person standing up for her. Because bear in mind, she was saying she wanted to die at this point. And he also poignantly asserted, I don't think there is any societal goal that is reached by executing someone who might be mentally ill. But in spite of that reasonable, and correct argument. Eileen Carol Wernos was executed on October the 9th, 2002, in spite of misgivings from many who met her and knew her. Now, indisputably, that woman was a danger to society and she definitely needed to be incarcerated to protect herself and to protect those she met. That goes without saying. She was a convicted murderer. She absolutely needed to face justice. However, whatever story you choose to believe about the murders, one cannot help but wonder at the motivation for her six death sentences without any recognition of the intolerable life experiences and her unstable mental health. After all, a sadistic and heinous killer like Ted Bundy was offered life imprisonment instead of execution. I mean, he didn't take that and he got executed, but he was offered it and there is no comparison where his crimes are concerned to hers. This then has to beg the question, did the fact that Wernus was a woman who not only killed men, but who tarnished their reputations mean that she was treated more harshly in a system dominated by males than a man facing a similar sentence? Should rehabilitation and treatment not have been offered to this incredibly damaged, this incredibly neglected individual, a woman who was let down continuously by a system, a woman who was literally sold when it came down to her story, when it came down to every single individual who should have cared for her more, who should have treated her better. This woman, her whole life was exploited. And yet, when it came down to recognising the story behind why she acted, giving her some mitigating circumstances to carve out the killer she became, it was just ignored thrown to the wayside. And she was instead exploited by every single person, essentially, that came into contact with her. I find this case one of those really conflicting cases because they definitely put to death a mentally unwell person and there is corruption there because that should not happen. Yes, people wanted justice for the victims. Yes, she absolutely deserved to go to prison for the rest of her natural life. But this was a woman broken by a heinous life. Like I said before, she stated that she hated the human race. And by the end of the experiences that I've talked about, I would suggest that everybody in her position would feel exactly the same. I'd love to know your thoughts. I hope you feel I've covered this appropriately and accurately. I hope you feel I've given it a deeper dive than you might have seen elsewhere. Certainly I needed to go back because the first case that I covered where she was concerned, it was much shorter and I hadn't done the due diligence that I do these days. So, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Do you believe they got it right? Do you believe that she deserved to be put to death? 
Do you believe that actually they answered her own prayers, that she was a woman who was so broken she'd chosen that it was time for her to leave this universe? Or do you feel that they literally put to death a mentally ill woman who had had a life full of mitigating reasons as to why she eventually became the killer that she did? Let me know your thoughts. I'll see you again next time. Be safe.